So, welcome everybody. Uh, we're about to start. Thank you. Uh, so, my name is Rafael, and I'm currently stationed at the Sao Paulo State University, but I'm here today to talk with you as one of the co chairs of the CoData RDA Schools of Research Data Science. And now we have a nice acronym for it, SORT. So it's much easier because every once in a while I got myself, well, is it the, uh, schools of research in the science and so on and so forth? So now it's much easier to, to remember. Uh, and we have online with us Hugh Shanahan, and uh, I'll be uh, also dividing the floor with Patricia and Rob that will do the closing. Uh, we also have here Louise, that's also one of the co-chairs of the group. And uh, I'm going to go through a brief introduction. Oh, no. <laughs> I, can, I can use the, net, the notebooks, not a problem. I'll see if I can find somebody to uh, do that. I know I like to wonder when I... <laughs> Yeah, so to so, uh, that brief introduction to the SORTS group, so uh, the group, the idea of the group was to create a community of researchers. It was, it is mainly focused on early career researchers. And uh, uh, the thought behind creating the schools was that most of us have already know that there is a gap in most of the formal education regarding data science disciplines, right? And uh, uh, and that is particularly true in low and middle income countries. Okay, so the idea of the group was to create a program of basic training on data science disciplines and also open science, research data management, and uh, data analysis and stuff like that. Uh, as I said, it, is, it was mainly focused on low and middle income countries, although we already hosted a few schools in, in, in higher income countries as well. Usually what we do is we try to bring as many students from low and middle income countries as possible for these events, and it has worked great so far. And who we are? We are a network of volunteers uh, that do the helping during the the sessions we do the teaching and there's also the co-chairs that most of the time they are also the teachers and the helpers and and we do a lot of things uh, uh during the schools uh the there are two organizations that help founding the the the, the group was codata and rda and we also receive uh, received funding from both uh, there are a couple of partner, organiz partner organizations, including the uh, Institute for Theoretical Physics of Trieste in Italy. There's also a branch in Brazil and other organizations that uh, help us organizing uh, uh, the schools. Uh, they mainly give the, the, the place to have the schools, also do some admi administrative work, uh, uh, like selecting, you know, helping with the selection of the students, and giving away certificates and stuff like that. There's the network of founders, of funders, sorry. Uh, and this is the one that we are really looking into creating. Although we still, we already received fund from uh, a few organizations. And there is also the local host. I mean, the people within the each institution that helps organizing the, the, the schools. Okay, so uh, a few numbers regarding uh, how well the schools have been so far. Oh, no, no, it started working. I'm yeah. so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry. It's because it works in. Yes, exactly. <laughs> magic one. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah, so uh, this, is, this is from the 2021 Ignition reports that we produce. And uh, at 2021, we have hosted 11 schools and trained around 30, 335 participants. Uh, these are the two week schools. Usually, the schools they have two weeks, and we, uh, uh, 
Yeah, that's it. <laughs> we also have hosted uh, virtual schools. So far, we did three, mostly during the pandemics. And for those schools, we received around 267 participants. And those schools, they, well, we tried several formats. We tried one with the, the first one that was the same format that we did for the in-person school. This was very fast uh, and very convincing. And we also tried to uh, divide the schools into longer periods. So we, now we had the schools that took over seven weeks or something like that, more than well, two months, around two months. Uh, yeah. Uh, we also have hosted data steward instructor training. I'm sure you will be able to talk a little bit more about that if you have any questions. But those run over night, well, was, they, they usually take one week and we've hosted nine events with 244 participants and there is also uh, uh, we try to foster this alumni network uh, which Lou is mostly responsible has done a lot of the work that uh, uh, the alumni network has produced and try to organize she tried to organize webinars there's also newsletters that Mostly Bridget helps us a lot, uh, competitions, and right now we have uh, around 244 members. Okay, so this is a nice map of the places we have already hosted schools. Okay, yeah. I think there's, well, this is from 2021, so there are no US schools, but we did one last year there. And for this year, the planning for this year is to have uh, uh, a school in Pretoria, South Africa, but this will be an online school. Also, probably one in Miami, that should be in May, Atlanta in June. Uh, these two should be uh, hybrid events. They would have components of uh, in-person and also virtual. We'll also host uh, Trieste School. This has been the annually school that we, are, that we usually organize. And that should be in July, August. And well, we are trying to have also one in Sao Paulo, December, but still to be confirmed. Okay, so now I'll give the microphone to him. Him, you can go ahead and. All right. Thanks very much, Raphael. Um, so first of all, can I just do a a quick check can everybody hear me or am i simply talking into the ether i hear you can hear you but if you could speak louder that okay would okay how's that great is that better yeah it's better okay excellent okay so uh, uh first of all i uh, i'd like to express my apologies for uh, not being with you today uh uh, various difficulties uh, at home meant that I had to 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 cancel coming along to 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 RDA. It's great to see you all. Uh, I'm I'm really really sorry that I can't I I can't be there and to catch up with you all in 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 person. Let me so let me get started. What I'm going to do here is basically a a, a part one of a two-parter, which is to, um, uh, we're going to talk about a specific project that's being funded by uh, EOS Future and the RDA. I'm sort of laying the ground here. Uh, and then uh, after that, I'm going to hand over to Patricia, who's who's going to explain all of the, the hard work that she She's been doing here because this is this is this is her being doing do, doing much of this 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 work. So uh, if it's okay, uh, can I go to the, the the next slide, please? Thank you very much. All right. So Raphael has already done a really nice sort of background of the schools and the goals behind that. And uh, for a moment, for one slide, uh, I, I, uh, we're going to like rest on our laurels, uh, which is to say, since 2016, we're, uh, we've done multiple training events, both for ECRs and for, 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 for data stewards. We've developed in both of those instances something which is a really 
mature set of training materials and a really mature way of delivering that training uh, for, for both of those communities. We've got lots of practice and I would say we're really, really good. It's a very high quality that, that it's very high quality training that 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 we're delivering here um now our priority has always been low and middle income countries because that's where the the the, the need is is greatest however uh, we always emphasize this that you know that's the priority it's not and it's it's not to be seen as a sort of a second class type of training and indeed what is very clear is that this delivery mode works extremely well for high income countries as well. Um, and uh, part of the reason why this, this particular project is being funded is to say that these modes of training we think are extremely good, for example, for, for example, EOSC. Okay, and you know I'm sort of picking the European example because that's the place where we got the, the funding from, but imagine this also happening and, you know, and in any in any other high income country or, uh, 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 across the globe, it's all the more remarkable in terms of we we started out by doing something which was heavily focused on being residential, sort of face to face teaching. COVID came along and you know really like everybody else pulled the rug underneath us, and yet uh, we've we we've plowed on. And we've actually developed a model which we think is is you know we've we've adapted and tweaked our model so we're able to do face to face teaching we're able to do fully online teaching and we're able to do hybrid teaching in other words teaching which is you know some events are face to face and some events are are are, are online we're really adept at that now okay so that's enough of me um sort of saying yay we're great and now it's it's a bit where we need to be kind of uh fully upfront about what are the things what are our our, our weaknesses where are the things that that we're, we're we're quite frankly struggling along and these are the sort of bottlenecks that are that are having i think the, the, the first and foremost thing is 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 our is our funding is that at the present moment for every sort of training event that we do we have to gather sort of ad hoc financial support, which it takes a disturbing amount of time every time the co-chairs were gathering around, we're sort of saying, okay, let's knock on doors, let's let's make things happen, and, and so on and so forth. Now, I want to stress that this is not, everybody's sort of like, we need money, okay? Everybody, every organization, every endeavor needs money. But to stress, when we are given sort of uh, some amount of sustained funding, we're able to get an enormous amount done. So for example, um, uh, from 2019 to, to uh, uh, 2021, uh, uh, we were part of the Fairs Fair project. And with that, we managed that, you know, neatly covered the, 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 the COVID era. Uh, and yet we managed to make that transition to doing things online with the, with the benefit of, of, of Fairs Fair support. And we developed pretty much from scratch the, 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 the data steward curriculum that we have now. So it's, it's we get things done when, when we have that. Now, the next thing, which is kind of goes hand in hand with the, with the, the funding is the fact that as we've developed, we've done so, you know, we're, we're, this has been a very, very creative process in terms of figuring out what's the right type of, of, of materials that we do and what's the right type of teaching. We're trying out interesting ideas for, for teaching. I remember one of the, the uh, uh, one of our first uh, schools in Trieste, we had one of the, the, the software carpentries instructors and uh, she said, yeah, this is one big experiment that you're, you're doing, which is, which is great. But now that we're sort of like, we understand what we're doing, we need to sort of settle down in terms of the processes that we're doing and, and kind of professionalize that. So there are, there are whole sorts of sets of questions that we're, we're, we're continually coming up against, which kind of gets in the way of us getting, getting the job done. So for example, saying, okay, what precisely is the relationship between our hosts, funders that we have, instructors, and, and so on. 
and we need to 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 get that uh, it feels like it right now what we're doing is is every time we run a training event we're we're kind of renegotiating everything it takes up a lot of time other questions like how do we update our materials in a timely fashion uh, what sense is our online presence feels like which i'll kind of show which we'll we'll show to you a little bit uh, a little bit later on okay uh, i'll just go on to the next slide if possible thank you so now uh patricia is going to go into a lot more detail uh, uh uh on this but what we needed to do was to basically professionalize everything that we're doing so we need to document the processes that we have all right so that includes of how our organization runs and how we do things like figure out how we do development of materials and curation we need to clarify the roles that that are that are that are here so for example what do our instructors do because one of the things we want to do is is sort of really say okay this year we'll do instructor training and and really really make that 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 happen and the whole purpose of that is ultimately so that as an organization we're working in a completely transparent fashion as opposed from what we're doing right now which is which is not like we're deliberately kind of hiding ways because we're just uh kind of deciding things as, as a kind of very much on the fly uh and if we're transparent then that's something that makes our case the value add that we provide much better so in particular that goes back to the funding question in terms of saying here's our organization this is precisely what we do this is how we do it and that means that makes a very very good proposition for 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 for, for funders it also makes our lives easier and it also makes the lives of 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 our partners easier as well so if it's okay i'll just move to the 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 the, the last slide and this is all made possible by uh this particular fund uh uh ironically enough um i had a quick chat with ari asmi at the last uh or Asian dig in seoul i was one of the few people who who got out there ironically enough and um, he said, yeah, "Yeah, go for it. This is this is this is precisely the sort of thing that 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 we should do there." So this is being funded by EOS Future through through RDA. We are enormously grateful to the to them to get this support. So at this point, what I'm going to do is is hand over to Patricia, who's going to sort of document things in 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 more detail on what has been done so far. Thank you, you. Um, hello, everyone. I'm going to take this off so maybe you can hear me a little bit better. I don't have to shout through a mask. Um, my name is Patricia Hatterich. I'm a um, consultant and project officer to the uh, CoData Sorts team, um, paid by that pot of money that you just mentioned, um, and hired to help uh, the co-chairs with uh, some of these the, the work here. Um, so, um, what does this project look like? It has four work patch packages. Um, you already kind of introduced some of them. Uh, work package one is um, focusing on formalizing the processes. Um, that is a lot of like boring background material, but that's kind of key to uh, running the schools around fees, around memoranda of understanding and onboarding processes. Um, work package two is around uh, platforms to host material. Um, you already indicated in that one as well that there was a lot of like moving around, moving online, playing around with things. Um, so that is a form of work package to uh, look into that uh, in, in a bit more detail and, and figure out what works um, for which use cases. Um, work package three is looking at the uh, existing curriculum. Um, and how that is uh, supposed to be maintained um, or updated. Um, and then we have uh, an additional work package for technical infrastructure that is um, to set up a customer relationship management and formalize the process of getting in touch with all the uh, various people um, that the school works with and um, also to integrate, integrate with the, the website. Um, a bit better because at the moment things are in various places and they're not necessarily as connected up as they um, as they could be. Um, I've been 
mainly brought on board to uh, work on work package one and work package through. So that's the bit that I'm going to talk you through. And then um, Hugh uh, talks a little bit more about the, the platforms and the technical bits. Um, so what have we done so far around formalizing processes? Um, one of the tasks was to actually look at costs. Um, what does it actually cost to put on a school, in a, especially in a high-income country? Um, so when, when uh, hosts get in touch, we can actually put a, you know, proper costing together, um, give them numbers, um, and make sure that is a little bit more sustainable going forward. Um, so uh, there we've I've created a, a spreadsheet that basically takes all the, the costs into account. Um, various versions of, um, you know, how the how big the school might be, uh, where where in the world it might be. Um, that's something that is like uh, an, an internal document because it kind of at the moment obviously makes the the, um, the, the costs uh, detailed. But we have discussed this with the, the advisory board and gotten good feedback from them and just made sure that that's kind of reasonable and on track. Um, the other piece I've worked on um, is a template for a memorandum of un understanding. Um, that is, as he said, like, at, like um, at the moment, collaborations kind of happen ad hoc. And if there's any paperwork that needs to be put in place, that's also created ad hoc. Um, so the goal for this was to um, create a st standard text Standard memorandum of understanding that can be used um, for any any organization that wants to host the school and um, makes clear what the expectations are, what the responsibilities are for a host, what is delivered by the um, uh, by the schools, and um, I've also developed some guidelines um, that uh, make it easy to adapt the, the current text for other use cases. If some if a funder wants to get in touch and fund um, five schools in, in a different uh, institutions, that's then easily doable as well. So that's basically out of the box um, now there for um, the co-chairs to work with in case an interested party uh, gets in touch and wants to host uh, a school or work um, otherwise with the with the SWORDS team. I've also looked at the roles and responsibilities um, a little bit that was um, just to a familiarize myself as someone who was new to the schools or fairly new to the schools. I kind of knew they existed, but I didn't um, really know what it looked uh, from the inside. So that was to, to figure out um, what is in place, who ha has which roles and responsibilities at the moment. Um, is this written up somewhere? Um, does anything need, need clarifying? And um, you know, where do, do I come in and um, create additional processes around this? Um, so the major um, stakeholders there, and it's kind of the, the I, I've, taken a visualization, but I think I ended up in like kind of with bubbles that somehow also um, depict the, the, the importance of various stakeholders. So the, the big um, or the, the most important are really the, the co-chairs. Um, they are volunteers, but they're like doing most of the work and um, their tasks are reasonably well um, written out. There are instructors that come in supporting the schools uh, and um, help us that support the instructors in the classroom. There are hosting institutions, there's the advisory board, there's like CoData and RDA that are like supporting institutions providing funding. Um, obviously we have students and uh, alumni attending and one of the things that um, came out uh, as uh, out of the, the review as a new role is um, that we formalize something called, that we call curriculum review experts. So there are people that can be instructors coming in every once in a while and actually teaching a part of the curriculum. 
but there are um, also just a group of people that um, the, the co-chairs can count on to um, give feedback on um, the existing material. And a little bit more on, on that in a bit. So um, what uh, have, have we, we done so far around the roles, as I mentioned, um, for any hosting institutions, that's now the MOU in place. Um, <laughs> formalizes their responsibilities. We've started planning and onboarding process for new instructors. Um, <coughs> it's gonna be piloted later this year um, as the first instructor <coughs> training that the schools will run for the co-chairs. Um, um, I kind of looked at the, the uh, terms that are there and updated a little bit <coughs> while we are on, uh, while we were looking at that. We realized that it's you know um, written up quite nicely for people to come on board, but it's there's no obvious process how someone would step down from that role when they don't have like the capacity to volunteer any longer. Um, so I've also created an offboarding process, and as I just said, like the curriculum review experts came in as a new roles, and they also now have uh, terms of reference. Um, that can be put out when, when we're asking people to come on board in that role. In terms of uh, curriculum maintenance and uh, looking at the material, um, I first of all, like basically look what's out there and the kind of obvious starting point felt like um, the uh, community on Zenodo and all the material that was deposited there. Um, I got the RDA recommendations for minimal metadata set to aid harmonized discovery of learning resources because that felt like, you know, that, that is something that fits the um, fits curriculum material and basically recatalogued um, what is on Zenodo with those metadata fields. And um, also uh, basically done some additional annotation um, using the terms for fair skills ontology and um, playing around with that. So we basically have uh, everything that is on Zenodo nicely cataloged in a big spreadsheet. Um, what I've done then is um, from looking what is officially published as the curriculum. Um, what is actually used in schools. So I've kind of gone back to um, the um, school, last school that was hosted in Atlanta in autumn 2022, uh, which was hybrid and kind of clicked through uh, the schedule that was provided to the, uh, to the students and figured out what you know, material is used in, in, um, that, uh, in that school figured out that it um, links to a lot of videos on Vimeo that are kind of recordings from, um, from a, a virtual school. Um, and then basically cataloged uh, like about 200 Vimeo videos as well, um, in addition to the material that was in Zenodo and made, uh, uh, yeah. I thought those a little bit more findable and discoverable for the future. And um, based on me trying to figure that out, I uh, written a, a first draft of uh, recommendations of um, yeah how to regularly update the curriculum material, where I felt uh, found that like what is used in the session looks very different from what's on the nodo. So clearly there has been some uh, development in the meantime, but it hasn't been formally published as a, a new version of the curriculum. Um, and that ties in into something we're, we're gonna try in, uh, in April, and that is like exploring these curriculum review experts and um, combining it with the gaps that we've seen where some of the content could, could be updated. And um, we're trialing a scrutiny sprint, which is basically bringing those curriculum review experts together um, as, and making sure that the material is suitable for the, the audience it's currently pitched to, um, that the uh, learning outcomes match the content, and that um, everything is up to date, and we're not missing any, any uh, major resources. Um, we're going to pilot that with um, the data stewards 
um, stewardship curriculum. And it's going to be like a virtual session, um, bringing folk together and then basically a little bit of work um, in, the, in the days or weeks after that to provide feedback and input on how the curriculum should be changed. So anyone is interested in that, save the date. 24th of April, uh, 26th of April, and uh, we're going to um, put out like an official call for, for people to become curriculum review experts um, after RDA. So didn't want it to get lost in all the announcement emails, um, but it's coming. Um, and yeah, hosting platforms, the other work packages. You are you happy to take over? Yeah, sh sure thing. Uh, and again, just let me know if I'm talking too quietly. Um, all right, so the, the, the fourth work package associated with this, this, this project has to do with the different types of platforms that we're using. So one thing that we've, we've already done is uh, obviously for our online teaching or the, the, the hybrid teaching, it's useful to have a virtual learning environment. Now, in, in some cases, we have, used, for example, for the Atlanta schools, um, we've made use of, of, of GitHub, and that seems to, to, to the, you know, in some cases, that seems to, to work okay. We've also been using other types of virtual learning platforms that have been provided by the hosts. Uh, one of them, uh, so for example, we used uh, Blackboard in Pretoria uh, and in Trieste, we used this, this, this platform here, Moodle. Um, the thing what we've decided to do, what we've done for this project is that we've purchased a one-year license uh, for a cloud instance of, of Moodle. And in particular, what that means is, is that's something that then kind of we control and we can get done uh, as as we see fish, we'll try and use this at least for for Pretoria and the Atlanta schools, and and this is something that we can we can we can we can trial out. Um, it's it's not trivial the costs associated. Well, initially it's it's quite trivial, but it, it rapidly gets more expensive, and it's kind of there saying, okay, this is a chance to assess that. If it's okay, I'll move on to the next slide, Patricia. So if we look at the the uh the, the the key thing we really need some some technical support on is that at the present moment all the individuals that we have students alumni instructors helpers curriculum review experts and so on these are all very much recorded in in an ad hoc fashion it's not quite at the if I use the phrase mental rolodex that sort of sits in the brains of all of the the co-chairs but it's 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 always on a Google a spreadsheet on a Google Drive somewhere, and this is this is this is important information, and we need to develop a, a service which is you know if you know the business it's basically a customer man relations management software to keep information about all these individuals in place and to do so in a in a compliant fashion. The, the candidate service that we're, we're looking at is something called Amy, which is an open source package developed by the, 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 the Carpentries. Uh, it, it, Patricia, if you click on there, there's, there's a very boring <laughs> page just to, just to show that it's, that it's there. This is something that's, 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 that's open source, so we can, we can use that. So what we'd like to do is to trial this out uh, and uh, and ultimately deploy it with some documentation so we can keep using this going forward. If I can go on to the next slide, please. The other point to note is that it's become clear that we have a whole bunch of different services that we're using for our online presence. So we have a website, we have a GitHub repo, we have a Zenodo community page, we have a Vimeo page. Uh, and of course, there's there's, there's there's good old fashioned social media, and we need to have just better integration between these different services, which is not anything to stress. It's not going to be something terribly fancy. It's it's mostly about making sure that on our website, we're cross referencing everything that, that all the other services that we have in a, in a thorough fashion and sort of updating the the, the the look and feel of the of the website. 
to do that, uh, we uh, need somebody with the kind of uh, uh, background to, to, uh, to, to do those sorts of tasks. Uh, we uh, have, and we've just uh, last week, uh, 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 Louise Bezegnoush and I uh, uh, spoke with somebody and made an offer to, to somebody to, to take up that role. So soon we'll get that, 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 that he'll, be, he'll, be, he'll be joining us as well. So Patricia, I'll hand back to you if that's okay. Yeah, and I just um, give you a little bit of an idea of what is still outstanding in, in the project and on the project's to-do list. Um, I mentioned that we do have a, a process um, or draft process uh, um, in place for inspector onboarding. So that is now then on to us to actually um, turn that into the first uh, um, training session for instructors in, in summer. Um, a lot of the things um, that I've worked on are basically on, on a Google Drive at the moment, which is like, um, you know, not very transparent and um, uh, friendly for reuse. Um, so uh, um, one of the big tasks is to actually um, put these all on the, on the website, um, um, figure out with a technical colleague or where, where things are, um, are hosted and where they are linked. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, a lot of the, the things um, at the moment are, aren't visible to you yet, but hopefully will be in the next few weeks. Um, obviously with things like the EOS Knowledge Hub come around uh, or other platforms that are useful, we do have all the the metadata and um, yeah, a good overview of the curriculum in place now, so we can easily um, add that into any um, any platforms that are suitable. Um, I've mentioned the scrutiny sprint, um, so that's uh, uh, another thing that we're playing around with and just uh, learning from that and updating processes um, accordingly afterwards. You uh, mentioned the um, big piece of technical infrastructure that's to come. And um, again, that ties in with quite a few of the processes that I've written up um, that I hopefully can then get to get to implement in a, in a system. And uh, another point that we, um, a task um, that is uh, in, in the program is like, create some value add material, um, which is um, very specific uh, indeed, um, which brings me to um, a little bit of discussion and getting you um, involved because the, the value add material at the moment aren't like um, particularly well scoped. So they could be basically anything the community asks us to provide that would be useful. Um, so if you have any ideas, um, what, what they, from what all the things that you've just heard about the schools, everything that you know, um, that what should be included in value add material, who they should be tailored for, who you think, you know, would benefit from getting a, a nice one page, or two page summary, um, of anything, this is your chance to get involved. We do have these questions as well. If someone wants to provide written feedback. There is the, actually the notes document for the session. Um, Hugh has created a bit.ly link for that. Uh, that also contains some a sign up. So if you have your um, machine in front of you and would like to um, get engaged there, please go to the shared note document and um, yeah, you find the questions here, but we also have a few minutes to discuss, do we? 20? 20, 20. 20 minutes for, for me to wrangle the room. <laughs> Chris. Yeah, there's some, um, I'm curious how you landed on Amy, because uh, when, when I was with the carpentries that we had, uh, we had a contractor that would work on, you know, sort of updating it and doing various things. And the contractor was, uh, you know, was a friend of the community, wasn't 
too high of a cost, but still cost. Um, and uh, and also like Amy requires some skills as well, like SQL skills and other things. I, I don't know if it's advanced since then, but like it seems like what you're after some some of the sort of out of the box solutions out there, you know, as far as maintenance wise might might be easier for you than you know like it so was it like maybe the connections with github or other things like that that made you lead, lead you to that or yeah i think that's one for you to answer yeah hi chris How... hi you <laughs> chris thanks thanks for that no look i need to kind of put my hands up and sort of say uh uh i kind of lightened on 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 amy because it's saying oh okay that's an open source it's something that's 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 open source it's available for us to you know so so there isn't you know we develop we have that as as we as as we see fish i didn't try and kind of sort of say okay uh we can't go and and follow something like uh, uh um use the crm that where we have to 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 pay money for because that's something which is 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 rapidly going to run beyond our budget and we don't want to be sort of in uh, locked locked into that but if and i and i think this would be something that if you chris or anybody else in the room are sort of saying uh, hang on there's there there's 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 a there's a better open source solution out there Kind of please 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 say so uh they said we've 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 just employed this this the 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 the, the person um uh and and it'd be great to get to 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 get feedback from from folks on this Chris, do you want to answer or like uh are we you keep no I, I i just if you're going to use uh amy then uh you can also have the same relationship with the contractor that they use and i just know that they've they they it happens every once in a while where they have to update and they have to you know reach out to the contractor um so there's cost involved there that's so i understand the open um course yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I i definitely understand that but there's cost involved with bringing you know with using amy to just yeah you probably knew that already but um, okay. But yeah, if you have a relationship with the carpentries and the contractor, then maybe that's how you work it out. Uh, but uh, okay, I mean there isn't. We don't have. You know, is, this was this is something that the the, the carpentries suggested suggested to us. Um, we don't have a relationship with the with the with the with the developer of Amy itself. We've we've got somebody who sort of. Who's who? Who we're we're kind of in, uh, in employing separately. And initially, it's sort of saying, "Oh, okay, this will be to deploy what's 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 there." Um, but you know, the, the, this is you know, it's it's something we can we can sort of stop and say, "Well, are the are 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 the off the shelf solutions better?" I suspect that it's there's there's always going to be a cost associated with using you know x crm package so um that's 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 what making me a little a little bit wary but you know that's my that's my thought there okay it wasn't yes i was wondering um whether you could use the eos infrastructure for the technical infrastructure you were uh, talking about because I mean, that's the relation and that what we are hoping for in the near future also to, um, yeah, it's not all ready, <laughs> we know, <laughs> but um, how, how, do you have any plans on integrating um, the stuff you do on now on other, on other platforms um, with EOS, for example? probably also with the with the knowledge hub or something like that. yeah so i mean i can answer that one mm -hmm. yeah. if you want to <coughs> so we definitely i mean we definitely have a lot of representation about eos in the code tech group as well so it's something we've been thinking about um the reason we decided on a middle instance um was because we needed to 
run schools now and the um, knowledge hub and open data are still in progress or i mean they're, they're not really up and running to the point where we need them in the next month uh, so what we are obviously going to do is once um once the knowledge hub is stabilized uh, we will be able to link to um our schools and then perhaps in the future we might just download a school package and re-upload it onto open Plato. so there's definitely there's going to be interaction but the 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 problem we have is that the EOS future funding uh, ends quite soon and we have schools to run so uh, we have to to do this as an interim step but we're definitely going to be looking towards that yeah, yeah i think it's you know it is a, a, a fair point louise about the about the 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 the, the EOSC infrastructure because um kind of going forward ultimately uh there's this there's, there's there's all sorts you know all sorts of things we'd like to 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 set up and 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 have running uh uh, uh and if 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 eosk can can provide that that would be that would be that would be fantastic um that i mean for what it's worth uh odata are sort of the the, the partner who's sort of overseeing the the, the, the they're the ones who who got paid for this and they're overseeing the purchasing, but they've also been sort of sitting with us in terms of providing us with our with their you know websites and you know the the, the and, and so on sort of there and that's that's the ones that we have kind of have the the the, the best working relationship with at the at the present moment with respect to our websites. But I, I, I yeah, using it in in the future would be would be would be awesome. <laughs> Alex, Alexander. yeah, Alexander. <laughs> yeah, right now each other from yeah. Zoom meetings. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, just, I was just going through the curriculum on GitHub, and it looks really good. All of the different topics that the school covers and so on. It's from 2016, so maybe it's not updated. Never mind. Uh, so, uh, two questions for me uh, arose while I was doing this. So. First one, what are the kinds of institutions that you usually create co uh, contracts with, uh, that, that you usually cooperate with in those uh, in low and middle income countries? And second is whether uh, there is room for those institutions from, for um, in employees or students from those in institutions to provide feedback on the curriculum. So for example, maybe their needs are different, maybe their previous knowledge differs from um, I know from Serbia and Brazil, our um, students have different software um, available to them, or uh, different previous uh, experiences, different needs. So, oh, okay. So, I think I got my point across. So that's my main uh, question. So, so let me let me say first of all, I wish we were so advanced we had contracts with these institutions. Uh, okay. that would, that would I got this like, uh, on the slide uh, <laughs> uh, contracts. Yeah. So. We're, we're we're aiming towards that. That's what producers oh, are okay. doing. And a lot of this formalization is, <laughs> okay. is moving towards we're contracts. We're making it look very good now. <laughs> uh, but, but the types of organizations those are usually our research centers, our universities. Um, we've done a lot of stuff with. Uh, with the International Center of Theoretical Physics, with um, oh, the East African uh, Theoretical. So there's Sephir and there's Irfir, and, and I always, Raphael will, will know the, uh, the uh, what those abbreviations are, but the, uh, yeah, the well, so, yeah. <laughs> so, so a lot of times with research organizations that are usually connected to a university, um, those are the types of institutions that we normally contract with, though. Um, recently, the Atlanta schools and the, the Miami schools, the schools in the U.S., are connected again to universities, but research centers are uh, cyber infrastructure providers, providers with, through that. And uh, to your second question, the curriculum does it is modified and evolves pretty much at every school. Um, we're, we're in a high uh, uh, evolution type environment, so we ask that the instructors take the base material and make it their own, um, add you know, what is current and what their experience is. We don't necessarily want the curriculum to be uh, completely static from course to course. We want to provide a base moving forward. We've also done schools in various different discipline 
uh, areas of the, the Atlanta schools have been uh, health equity based. The, um, uh, there, there's been both Python and R, depending on the, the group in there. In Trieste, we do um, advanced schools that include high energy physics, um, uh, Internet of Things, and there's a bioinformatics. So we hopefully keep the curriculum uh, uh, flexible enough that it can meet the needs of the local institution, which you are absolutely correct that it's not always the same. And also just to compliment on that, uh, we always ask the students for feedback. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. you know. Almost obsessively. <laughs> we we yeah. aim for feedback after every module, just to make sure that everyone is on the same page and the progress is going well. And I think one of the tasks that I have forgotten to list is writing up the guidelines exactly for that. How do you adapt the core curriculum to the audience in front of you? So that's the bit that is like, it's on the to-do list, uh, but hasn't made it across to the slide set, but yeah. So I, I would argue we shouldn't formalize that too much because we want them to be able to adapt the material. So yeah, but so I, I think I it, it would be do. interesting for just yes. to ask a few questions of the thought process that um, the coach has so far going through just to get a little bit of an idea of which questions and aspects to consider and, um, you know, um, uh, not not being prescriptive, but just giving a, a, a guide to someone who has never done that before. So I think it's called guidelines any, uh, for adapting the curriculum uh, on the to-do list. So yeah, that's to come as well. Uh, Mickey first and then Chris. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure. Um, so one maybe recommendation and one question. The recommendation would be, I, so I, I didn't know anything about these data schools before coming here. Um, looking through the information on the web, it's really hard for me to figure out which categories have been covered. So listening to you guys talk, it's good to hear that, you know, you had specific schools focused on R or Python or data visualization. But it'd be great to have a category overview, maybe on the GitHub.io page or somewhere where we can browse through it. So I'm a digital preservation nerd. So for me, it's always interesting to see has that been covered and I can't figure that out right now and I'm going to give up very quickly because I find it frustrating if I can't figure it out um, so I think that'd be of great benefit to the wider community if that could be covered in there somewhere and then as a question I really like your uh, your approach of how you went through all the materials and categorized them to see what has been covered my question is if Codata RDA also kind of look beyond what has been already done within that ecosphere but to see what other institutions, universities who are doing this through code data or RDA have been doing along data schools. Because there's data schools everywhere, right? So has there been like a cross check and a benchmark to see what are they covering? What are we covering? What are we not covering? And why aren't we covering it? I don't know if any of the co-chairs wants to answer if that has been done, but I think that's a good <laughs> point to take into account for value at material is like what differentiates these schools from what is out there. Yeah. So, so let me let me ask if that was a volunteering somewhere in that question there was volunteering to uh, do that kind of uh, uh, comparison. Uh, no, yeah. nowhere. In there. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the, the motivations for the schools as well was to provide a broad and shallow introduction to data science, um, which most data science schools, when we started the schools, weren't providing, they were at a slightly higher level. So um, so the schools were kind of plugging a, a niche that we identified that, that wasn't really being covered. Um, we've, I know that the coaches do keep track of other schools coming out, um, but we haven't done any systematic reviews, um, but it was definitely, it's a definitely good idea. Yeah. If I can jump in there, I, I think the other thing that that I, you know, in terms of looking at the at at, at other sort of events, you, you either have schools which are you have, you know, the boot camp kind of model, which is which is really technical and is 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 aimed at, you know, days one to three let's get you up to speed on python uh and then by day you know 10 to 14 we have you doing stuff with with keras and tensorflow and 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 machine learning tools and 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 so on or you have schools which are very very focused on 
uh, refresh data management and and so on or you'll have events which are very focused on on the ethic side of things and 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 so on and i think the 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 thing we would argue in terms of and I, uh, my apologies for using the uh, this wretched little three letter acronym our usp is that instead of trying to do a deep dive in all into all of that we say to the people that you know that the the, the ecrs we're giving you a broad introduction, as broad and shallow as 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 Louise push it, where we try and point out all of these things and say these are things that you, sh you should be knowing about. Now we can't cover it in detail, but we are sort of opening the door and saying these are things that 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 you should be you should be exploring. Um, I think we haven't talked much about the data storage and structure training. That's 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 there. There's a great deal that's going on this particularly in Europe in terms of in terms of training that's there I think the thing that again is our sort of our 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 USP there is to very much focus on uh, uh, saying okay we're, we're trying to build up usually we try and run these on a regional basis and uh, we identify the fact that usually people in this are often very only recently employed into that role and are in a very very small team on the campus that they're that they're, that they're based and we're saying okay we're trying to introduce you to all of the other people in your region so that you can sort of share experiences and so on and also to to say a data steward spends a huge chunk of their time trying to um, communicate things. So here's a policy and explain why it is that this policy needs to be implemented this way and so on. So uh, we have a section on pedagogy in there to remind people, okay, this is how you teach stuff uh, and, uh, and, 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 and so on. And that I think is, is very much where, where that's the, those are the sort of niches that I think we're filling very much in, in both those spaces. I may have gotten this uh, this wrong, but like with the value add materials, um, uh, it, you you just uh, reminded me of like when, um, and, and this is again a different context, but it was when we were talking, when I was going out talking about library carpentry to uh, libraries, uh, we did develop pitch material. It was with administrators. Um, and uh, you know, did did talk about ECRs and other things like that. The value, you know, that could be a resource. I I never thought about it, but if you're interested, they're sitting in our GitHub repository, and uh, they were developed with like you know, university in Ireland, uh, university in the States, you know, Australia. So like, and then some of the slide decks, right, were meant for sort of these kind of communities. So might might be valuable, right, for that, that, uh, that is that what you're looking for, for the value add materials? I think uh, that is a very good point, starting point at least, yeah, to, to, to do something like that. So yeah, if you have the link or I go digging, um, that would no, be- No, I'll, I'll send it. <laughs> Thank you. That's uh, wonderful. And I think I got a little sign here that uh, uh, Raphael has like, uh, some more things to talk to you about, uh, and again, no, questions no. to ask. <laughs> so I'm handing over to, to you. Sorry to interrupt, but we still have 30 minutes, and we still have a few questions to ask the input from you guys. Sorry, Patricia. <laughs> you can keep commenting on the Google Doc. Yeah, 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 please do. Uh, so the next thing we want to talk about is how we perform curriculum updates. Uh, I, well, there was a few questions regarding this. And uh, the thing is that we need to uh, build uh, a process for updating the curriculum. It should be easier to find it. It should be uh, uh, trackable. I mean, we should see the change over time and how things change. And also, as Patricia suggested, how they could be customized to some schools or so forth. Uh, so so uh, let me give you one example, the one that we've been 
talking about doing an update. That's the data analysis module. So we have a data analysis module that covers both uh, basic machine learning and also artificial neural networks. And uh, these are the topics that we usually do uh, cover. I'm quite familiar with this one because I, I, I taught this in several schools. And uh, the thing is that uh, when we look at the students' feedback and we ask them, what did you least like about the module? Then the answer is the theory. <laughs> it was a little bit quick. This, this module runs for uh, two days and a half. Okay, and we have to cover all that topics. And uh, so much math which is important, they know it's important, or at least they were polite enough to say, well, it is important, uh, but it is confusing. And also, well, yeah, you have to rush through the materials because you have so much to cover in two and a half days. And in the end, when we run the survey, oh, the colors look awful. But uh, for instance, this one was from the Costa Rica school. And if we, if we ask how was the pace of the module, then around 30% of the students, they say, well, it was too quick. And uh, how was the level of the model? Then around 40% around of them, yeah, around 40% of them say, well, it was a little bit hard for me. And imagine that these people, they don't come necessarily from engineering backgrounds. Okay, so for instance, in the Pretoria School, we had a lot of people coming from social, social science background. And uh, so this is the questions that I'd like to ask and feel free to jump in and answer them. Or even if you have other comments regarding how we should do the updates of the modules, then, then uh, I'm very happy that to have this discussion. So the questions would be what new materials should be added or how can we detect that the curriculum scrutiny is needed or the curriculum is no longer good enough and so on and so forth. And how to manage curriculum scrutiny sprints. How can we leverage from uh, on RDA expertise and enthusiasm. I mean, how we can engage with the community to get uh, RDA and the community of RDA to uh, be involved in the curriculum updates. Uh, Link to other training communities that need to be established. As I said, we already have a, well, a very strong uh, uh, link with the with the software carpentry, the carpentries. Uh, so yeah, and if so if you have any other community in mind that we should be linked to, then then um, yeah, that would be great. So this is discussion points. <clears throat> Any comment? <laughs> Raphael, I've got an additional question. So, I mean, assuming that RDA is a very giving community and people are, are very willing to volunteer, what do you think is kind of the average amount of time we could expect people to commit to reviewing the curriculum? Because obviously, you know, we'd have to package it up in different ways. If you think, you know, like two hours is a fair amount of time to ask of someone or five hours is the, the fair amount of time to ask of someone. You know, do you think that there's a time limit for volunteering to look at our curricula? Based on what you would think for yourself? Can I ask what the question would be that you'd be asking them to respond to? Well, I guess that's the thing. I mean, I, I teach the uh, open and responsible research curriculum. My curriculum is not that long, so I could definitely ask someone to have a look at my slides or listen to my audios, and it would take maximum three hours. But Raphael's curriculum is over two days, so it would take a much longer period of time. Do you think it would be necessary for him to package up into discrete topics and ask people to review the topics, or do you think there is value to actually asking someone to just sit down and work through the whole thing. I mean, when you review stuff, there's often specific questions that you're asking people to respond to, obviously. So I, maybe it'd be useful to think further about what exactly you want feedback on. Because if you're just getting opinions, somebody, some person could say, yeah, this is great. The next person could say, well, it doesn't meet my needs. Mm. So maybe it's narrow down what you're looking for exactly from the review process. Mm. Maybe try and find people with different levels of experience as well. 
Yeah. Just for a newbie, obviously, it's going to be like, oh, for somebody with a lot of experience, it's going to be a different journey. That makes a lot of sense. So any ideas on the, the second question there? That's one that I think is, is quite interesting is uh, when do you, especially us who have created this material, sometimes uh, are, get so close to it that close to it that we don't necessarily realize when um, it's, it's becoming a little dated. It becomes almost part of our our general uh, practice of, of how we do. So is there a, some way to tell when a review is needed or to determine this should be reviewed, should it be periodic? Um, I, mean, I think to be able to, almost like an internal review process is a great idea. I think it's a useful thing to do. I mean, do you want these things to be meaningful to people who are coming from different areas of interest? Or is it you want to narrow down to that community at all? Like this kind of question to decide. Maybe we should try and formalize slightly. Yeah, I mean, I guess that, that sort of keeping things up to date, you talked about how you collect feedback is exactly how the carpentry sort of update material. Is it, you know, that, that gets recorded in issues or other things like that, and then the maintainers, you know, maintainers on each lesson sort of go through and tackle those, because, you know, that, that's what you record if you're doing a workshop, someone will go in and say, notice this or that. And that's what that's that's how sort of those lessons get updated. So I mean, the students they they create issues, for instance, in GitHub or something like that regarding the the materials, and then the the maintainer is able to 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 look at them and. And again, a lot of times these materials are given to somebody at a local um, at the local event instead of we say, "Here's a base to start from. Make them your own." That adds not only a regional um, uh, spin on them, which is necessary, but also allows them to, to review the materials. However, what we may not do is always take that feedback into account for uh, updating that base material. So I, I guess maybe one metric there is how much needs to be uh, updated to for the person who's asked to present that material. Um, but again, that doesn't always work when we uh, present that material over and over again, uh, or this group is asked to travel. So, uh, yeah, and it, it's kind of an interesting uh, thing. And, and the simple answer is do it periodically, but there are some things that um, the material doesn't change that off. Our introduction to visualization, visualization now is, is uh, uh, at least the foundation level is pretty set and won't change that often. Whereas things like machine learning are, are changing on a daily basis, it seems, uh, um, and there are new concepts that need to be yeah, continually. I have a sense of unease about my curriculum. <laughs> I have to add stuff then. <laughs> Chris, are you, are you talking about um, at the end of the Carpentries workshop, you do a retrospective? So it's not so much the students, but it's the okay, good, good. the people delivering doing a retro yeah. on how it went. Yeah, yeah, it's the it's the instructors that uh, really a lot of these, not the students, um, and that 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 actually in review of the feedback, they'll also log something that seems like a strong theme. Um, yeah. One of the problems though with the schools, with the model that we have, the in-person schools over two weeks, is in order to keep the cost down and the burden on the instructors down, you tend to pitch up for your course and then leave. So we don't really have a set of instructors who'd be following the whole school and, and getting the critical reflection of the whole school. Um, so we are relying on the instructors to be honest and self-critical enough to actually say, I could probably update that example, it's a bit embarrassing if I'm still teaching it. I'm talking about myself, don't worry. <laughs> I, I, I put my own course there, so yeah, I know what he's saying. No, I, I'm laughing because I know instructors that <laughs> it, it is supposed to be something that you do, uh, you know, you make time for it in, in the training. Set. But yeah, I know some that <laughs> are not like that. So yeah. Um, 
the many of the materials were based originally on the carpentry's materials, and and I don't know if there's any effort to pay attention to how much they diverge or have diverged from the original. And of course, the carpentries are are also evolving and adapting to surveys and feedback. Um, that's one, and the other one is you know. Uh, how can we le leverage expertise and enthusiasm, provide incentives? I mean, we've been relying on goodwill for, hey, review these materials and provide good feedback, but we don't provide any incentives for people to do it, other than the fact that they can walk away feeling like they've done something good. Steve, and, what would be an incentive then? I don't know. I think, I, but I don't think we should dismiss it out of hand because mm -hmm. no, I don't I'm have the idea. I generally me. don't have ideas. <laughs> I just pose questions. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> um, ideas I left think, a long time ago. Oh, yep. So I, I, I would jump in. One thing um, that that I have noticed is. Um, Actually, writing, having simple thank you letters written not back to the person, but to their organization is, is something that does get noticed. I mean, I, I, I did, you know, refereeing for, for, for a grant reviewer. And for whatever reason, that institution, that, that organization sent a letter to, to the president of my university. And this kind of went, went all the way down to my head of department and said, oh, you got this. Everybody was really impressed with that. So maybe that's actually something we should be be, be thinking about because you know uh, uh, that 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 thank you is is because at least in my institution we you know in terms of promotion uh, we look at things like external engagement and so on. And if you're able to tick a box which says yeah I've I've done these these sorts of activities. That's something which is which is which is there that sits into people's promotion criteria. Uh, at least for academics, I'm not sure how it sits for 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 on, in academic services though. You? Oh, sorry. No, you. Yeah, um, on that point, I was involved with the collaborative replications and education project. It's in psychology, and it relies on the community people from the community reviewing student projects from time to time. So it would be something similar. And two things worked, uh, worked very, very well. So first, you don't reach out to them on a case by case basis. So you have a curriculum and then can you help me? You have to do it in a week. But first organize like a, a mess, um, organize a sign up of people who would be potentially willing to review at some point, for example, during the next year, and they say how many curriculums, in this case projects, they would be willing to review, and the turnaround time, so you have a sheet of the potential people willing to scrutinize for you, and uh, probably also the domain that they are experts in. And recently, um, the, crap that, the, the project, um, crap, um, uh, introduced incentives for the reviewers, but you would need to have a small funding for that. So they have the option either to take like five or ten dollars or to donate it to a charity. So it's not a lot of money, but uh, yeah, their academics are overburdened with reviewing for journals. So it can be hard to motivate them sometimes, but if you um, promise to do two reviews in a year, then people usually do it. And just to add on that, uh, well, yeah, maybe it's something that just occurred to me. Uh, well, we, 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 we keep our curriculum broad and shallow, so it's not like we are going to look for professors, something like that, maybe, well, I don't know, master students would do it, uh, since the materials are very, well, they are shallow, yeah, so, well, so, so it's, it's just introductions. Yeah, the system can be the same. Yeah, it's good yeah. to have various options if someone declines. And I just think it's good to build a database of people willing to or to get involved in that way and not to, and to then make that database public, maybe. 
I was um, going to suggest, and maybe you've already done this, but um, the organizational assembly, um, perhaps somebody would be willing it back to take to the data specialists and, and their organizations to review. Can't my hand That's a good point. That's no, fun advice because I'm the co chair. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that idea. <laughs> Chris? Yeah, I, um, I just want to second what Hugh said. Uh, that the letter is not just a good idea. It, some some people need it. Um, they need the letter, and I actually I, I don't think I can find an example. But I had to craft a letter for people um, that required it, you know, for their organizations and stuff. But if you're going to use Amy, then you can also uh, present some information online because you know having a letter or something like you know that's not visible something that people can point to i think you're but like uh you know posting some of this information amy has that capability of like you know exporting and markdown or stuff like that for your github run website so you can sort of have a place where you can tap into this information about what they did to that they can point to um because I've had it happen to me, like, if it doesn't have a link associated with it, if it's not on the web, then it wasn't real. For yeah, some yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so like, it, you know, I think just with the carpentries, the, the certificate was like, nice, but getting on the website, getting on, you know, like that, that's really what I think people sort of pointed to. And uh, yeah. Yeah, but I agree, right. like having the, the import it into LinkedIn, for instance. To show that you you've done that, yeah, yeah. So, Raphael, I, I hate to point people out, but I'd love to hear from the people who have observed but haven't quite given any feedback. I don't want to put necessarily anybody on the spot, but I'd love to hear from from those people who are having thoughts that they are not quite sure they want it to say out loud. Um, those are the things that usually we learn the most from. Please feel free to put them in the notes if you don't want to speak. Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, it, it seems that, that half the group has, has uh, given some input, but half the group is, I, I hope, is excited, um, but just not as vocal about the project. But is there anyone who hasn't said anything that have any ideas? Again, um, uh, if, you're saying, if you're wondering if you should say them out loud, you probably should because we're going to learn something from that. Yeah. Okay, so I'm a first timer at this the RDA and in this group in particular, but uh, I'm just curious. Um, this may be in the uh, somewhere on the uh, the website, but uh, why Atlanta? Uh, I, is it re a relationship with someone in the group that uh, that had the Atlanta in, in the? Uh, so I, I I think I hit on the reason why, but uh, <laughs> so so when we move to the US, one of the things we were looking for is not losing the flavor of underrepresented populations. Uh, so we partnered with the uh, South Big Data Hub uh, and something called Aim Ahead, which is a um, looking at minority serving institutions and AI education for minority serving institutions. So uh, um, and at the same time, the subject matter I mentioned is <coughs> equity. So these are researchers who are looking at equity issues in the health fields in both social and, uh, and um, uh, biological issues, right? So there are some diseases that aren't studied nearly as as heavily because they uh, don't have the same equity. Uh, I, so yes, yeah, so Atlanta, because we partnered with Georgia Tech where the South Big Data Hub was, and they had ties to that minority serving institution. So the invitees were all from minority serving institutions uh, in the Southeast. And, when I say southeast, I mean between Texas and Delaware, so it's not really southeast. But it's okay. <laughs> okay. Why southeast? So. There, there's a, a concentration of things that MSIs and Atlanta. It you know they all work together, so it's really more convenient. Okay. Uh, I was just curious as to why the node landed there. So, yeah. so also the biggest airport in or the busiest airport in the world, so I easy know. to get people to and and from. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, Right. inexpensive to get people to and from. 
So the reason I asked is I'm from Alabama, so I was curious if yeah the the, the networks were working with HBCUs and and Alabama or Mississippi or 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 the further west outside of the Atlanta metro area, which is an island unto itself. That's wholly apart from the, the I guess the rest of the the southeast, so the, the more rural parts of the southeast where uh, many of these. Uh, underserved uh, areas, especially in the health sector, are. So, yeah. and, and we hope to move to other mi uh, minority serving uh, institutions in the future. In fact, we one of the lists up there was Miami that said uh, FIU, you know, which is a Hispanic speaking institution. But we also hope to, in the future, move to other minority serving institutions. We want to stay with that flavor of at least trying to do our volunteer events at uh, under two underrepresented populations. Now, that's not saying that we wouldn't go to a, a University of Michigan, but we would probably um, uh, have a different financial model that would allow us then to fund things outside of, uh, of Michigan. So, um, we, we, since we do mostly volunteer programs, um, we want to at least make sure that volunteer is based towards where we can have the biggest impact. And if we do something outside of that, we're going to charge a different way for that and use that to fund back to what we should be volunteering towards, which has long been an objective but hasn't uh, hasn't quite caught on yet. Thank you. You may have noticed, and this is the thing I noticed, that he listed five uh, uh, um, countries up there in the beginning that were doing them. Um, South Africa is a upper middle income, or, yeah, upper middle income country. Um, Italy is an upper income, two in the US, which is upper income, and Sao Paulo, which is a, I think, upper middle also, or maybe even lower upper, <laughs> if, that's, if that can be done. So, so none of those schools actually uh, coming up this year are in low middle income countries where we initially focused the, the uh, group on. However, all of those do bring in, we do a lot of students to come in from the surrounding areas at, at our LMICs. So we have three minutes. <laughs> okay. yeah. Yes, please. <laughs> um, yeah, so something I've been thinking about while we're all talking is uh, in regards to the whole scrutiny and, and giving feedback. What I was wondering about is obviously you guys have a lot of expertise through doing these schools for a long time. Um, so while you ask other experts to give feedback, maybe you could you know, offer giving feedback back on, on whatever activities they have running at their institutions. So I don't know, like say, offer to take part in a course and give feedback on that, or just maybe offer, you know, sort of um, a feedback session where somebody can come to you and talk through what they're planning or what they're doing in terms of training and have, you know, just have you there as experts to kind of get, give feedback. And that way, maybe you could, you know, encourage them to get feedback on your curricula. So there is one thing that we've been planning, and uh, sorry that we didn't talk. I don't think we talk at all about the train the trainers program that we are planning to do. So uh, I think that, uh, that yeah, that would work as a forum for that because we plan to bring people, and well, this is how we usually teach our curriculum. Yeah, and that could be a good place to, to get the feedback and say, well, uh, I don't agree with that curriculum or so and so forth. And, and uh, yeah, yeah, but, uh, but uh, I, I like that model of having people. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. And I think in one of the previous slides it was, you know, like linking into other training communities. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> so, uh, so definitely, like if there are training communities who would like to get more closely intertwined with us, we'd be very happy to have that. Raphael, I think there's one more slide as well. Yeah, yeah. So it was just the the group for us. <laughs> I put the photos up. <laughs> I think you added the other one, uh, not the one that I updated at the at the common yeah. folder for the for the plenary. Sorry. <laughs> but anyway, this is the our group. <laughs> uh, yeah. Group of the chairs, this is Patricia. I also like to thank Bridget because she's done a lot of uh, hard work within the group, taking uh, care of the, of the newsletter and most of the time doing some web design as well. <laughs> yeah. Design's a big word there. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, I think we 
Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, so, I don't know if our email address is anywhere, but it is on the website. If anyone has ideas or Sorry. would like to get in touch with us, or would like to uh, consider becoming a helper or an instructor, please do reach out. You know, as Raphael and everyone has been saying, we are, now that we have systems in place, we are looking towards a, a model of expansion slightly, so we need more hands on deck. So if you're keen and you like the model, please do reach out to us. We're a really friendly group and we like talking about the schools um, and we love getting people involved. And if you come to Trieste, the pizza is amazing. <laughs> Can I ask, what, if you go back one slide to where you all are, like, for the sake of understanding better where you guys come from, could you maybe ask at your departments? Because I'm really curious to learn what kind of domains you yeah, are. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I cut that on purpose because it wouldn't fit the slide. But okay. at our website is <laughs> there. At our website is there. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Le leave that one up. So uh, uh, Lou said something about us obsessively asking for feedback earlier from the students. Let me say that we're not only asking for feedback, we're actually asking the participants who come in at the first level to run this program eventually, right? So uh, one of the things that I am happy about, happiest about and most proud of in this group is that now half of our co-chairs were originally participants of the schools. So that includes Rafaela himself was a participant, uh, Marcia, uh, uh, Marcy uh, Alvaro Cordova, uh, Sarah El Jahid, and Bianca Peterson were all uh, people who came to the school to uh, learn this foundational curriculum, who believed in the program, who stuck with us, and have have really made the program move forward. So um, we're not we don't only ask for feedback. We we want um, the people who participate to eventually run this. And and I want to do like I've done today and sit in the back corner um, to, for these schools and watch uh, that we built an or, uh, a program and an organization that can function without um, uh, can function indefinitely into the future. So um, so thanks for all of you coming. I hope that I see all of your faces and I'm trying to do a mental picture right now in one of our schools in the next year or two. Uh, that would be the, the ultimate outcome of this is to actually see you at one of these schools as a helper, as an instructor, um, as uh, um, an observer, um, as a, a host of any of these things. So you're, you're all welcome. Or as a welcome. curriculum sprint. Uh, that's a scrutiny. Uh, uh, so, uh, thank thank you all, and thank you, Hugh. Um, Thanks for Rob. for calling in. Um, but yes, and and let's uh, give Raphael a round of applause. You really want to we miss you, Hugh. <laughs> Uh, and we have a tradition that goes back to Philadelphia that we go out in the evening um, and we play pinball. Anybody, everybody know what pinball is? Um, there is a place called Zamenhof in downtown after the reception. Um, I'm going to play pinball. I welcome anyone who wants to join me. Um, I, I usually see Lou and Ben Cat. Uh, hopefully we can get Raphael there and, and others. So. So if you want to find out more about the schools, come up to the table. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it's right on the other side of the uh, of the uh, river.